and welcome to the Gaggle, where we challenge and, if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Samuel. Here with me today, of course, is uh, co-founder of the Gaggle, Peter Lavelle. So, Peter, um, today, Friday, August the 19th, um, there will be a meeting on the steps of New York Public Library of uh, Penn, the uh, writers, um, you know, you know, on the thread, and uh, and this will be in order to uh, express solidarity with um, Salman Rushdie. This, something similar occurred um, in 1988 or 89, when I, whenever the fatwa was issued. It was a similar meeting in New York, which I actually uh, attended, and a number of the people who were there uh, are no longer around. You know, Norman Mailer was. You know, was took pride of place. He's gone now. Um, and the theme of that meeting was, "We are all Salman Rushdie." Um, so, you know, now, thirty-four years on, um, the theme is going to be everyone's going to be reading out um, bits of um, satanic verses. Now, um, actually, they're all going to be talking about free expression, and, you know, and, and so on. The uh, problem is that um, the number of the people who attend these kinds of celebrations of free expression are themselves, of course, not in any way uh, advocates of free expression. They are like many people. They're only advocates of free expression for views that they agree with. They don't believe in free expression for views they don't agree with, which, you know, so, and one of the people who will be in attendance and reading uh, from the uh, works of uh, Salman Rushdie will be uh, Douglas Murray. Now, Douglas Murray, um, you know, who, who again purports to be uh, decrying, you know, the, uh, you know, you know, the Islamic intolerance and uh, you know, and woke culture and political correctness and all the rest of it. The West is in decline, so on. He was among the loudest to scream about uh, banning RT and Sputnik, um, which is unavailable anywhere uh, in Europe. It was absolutely, it should be banned, absolutely banned. Um, and of course, that's, that's true in a number of these uh, writers. They like Salman Rushdie because Salman Rushdie is one of them. He's a fashionable person. He's got fashionable uh, political views. He has fashionable friends. You know, he, he moves in fashionable circles in London. Um, they identify with him. But when it comes to freedom of speech of uh, Julian Assange, who incidentally did far more significant work than Salman Rushdie, because after all Salman Rushdie did in the, the He's a six, mediocre writer, George. A very mediocre writer. And he did nothing. I mean, no one has ever been able to uh, actually present. Has he offered a serious critique of Islam and, or anything like that? He was just being, you know, insulting. He wanted to insult Muslims. OK, I mean, obviously no one wants to um, you know, punish him with violence or anything like that, um, but nonetheless, he didn't really offer anything, you know, very substantial. Um, and and this is really the the point we, we get to. It's the same with the Charlie Hebdo thing. We get to feel very superior. Well, we of course we're, we're, this is part of our liberal tolerant West. We we don't do things like that. Well, of course we do do things like that. You know, there, there, you know, uh, you know, we have our uh, sacred uh, gods. Um, and if you violate those, the punishment will be, you know, quite extreme, you know, as extreme as anything imposed by the fatwas. I mean, for instance, um, Holocaust denial is a crime. I mean, throughout Europe, you know, you try writing a book about Holocaust denial, you're, you're going to be in prison. Um, and chances are you, people are going to set upon you in the streets, beat you up, and no one's going to waste a tear on you. So there is so much bad faith and so much hypocrisy when it comes to the issue of uh, Salman Rushdie that, you know, it, it really is quite nauseating. Hey, what do you think? And the same people that um, are selective in, in um, protecting some people's speech and not others, they are for the most part bullies. So some of the worst bullying we have in the public sphere are these uh, uh, journalists, uh, uh, influencers, I hate that term. They themselves are the most intolerant and uh, Douglas Murray, He's written two hit pieces on me, never contacted me, never never reached out to me. And I actually like a lot of his thinking on a lot of different issues, but he's a bully, okay? And he's, you know, why don't we have an, an exchange? What, what, why you think uh, RT should be banned? Well, I'd, I'd participate as a good faith actor. 
But no, they won't. They won't do that because none of them like to be challenged. They always have to punch down instead of having a reasonable conversation. And of course, you know, you know, on the steps of Penn and no one's thinking about Julian Assange, well, that's their problem. And it's their uh, pathos when it comes to their own profession, if they claim to be protecting journalism and, and freedom of speech. I mean, this Julian Assange issue is gonna gnaw at them until they kill him, okay? And then he'll be a martyr for all time, okay? I hate to speak in such apocalyptic terms, but I think I'm right. You and I have talked about this at great length. So those that, you know, it, you know, it's the left, it's the left. Well, their conservatives are just as bad, okay? And I really don't like this, you know, artificial um, binary, you know, they, these people do it, but we don't, no elites do it and they want to be able to it, it, it it's like the old guild system of of, of years of, of centuries ago you know no new ideas you have to go through the apprenticeship you have to be accre uh, accredited you have to have all of this and then you're one of us and if you go through all of that process you probably will be because right. you'll want to protect the protect the right. guild as well that's right and a very good example of that is um the case of alex berenson now alex berenson was uh, banned uh, by Twitter, and then he filed a lawsuit against Twitter, and somehow miraculously the lawsuit was settled, and he was let back on Twitter. It ha doesn't happen to anyone else, but it happened to him. Um, so what did he do? As soon as he's back on Twitter, he is gloating and uh, clapping his hands with glee over the um, attempt, essentially, to destroy Alex Jones, because what's the the, the courts uh, are being used to destroy Alex Jones. So, so let's remember, Alex Jones was, again, he was deplatformed, kicked off YouTube, he kicked off uh, Facebook, kicked off Twitter, um, but that wasn't enough. You know, they, you know, they had to escalate it because he has such a following that he could still continue to function. So how do you do it? Well, you basically do it by just breaking him financially. So we had these uh, all sorts of nonsensical court cases of uh, seeking to you know, blame him for, uh, you know, for, you know, for essentially something that they were offended, you know, the parents of the children at, um, uh, in Connecticut, Sandy Hook, uh, were offended, and they were somehow going to be blame him for it, even though the, the issue that this was a setup was not even his idea. You know, he, he just expressed his views. But nonetheless, whether it was his idea or not, you can't just simply use the court system essentially to destroy somebody. I mean, you know, he, you know, people who had actually have suffered nothing at his hands. He didn't shoot anyone. He didn't advocate shooting for any anyone. Um, and, uh, and and Berenson, who had just experienced this with Twitter, being kicked off Twitter, was there. He was great, yay, great. Alex Jones is horrible vermin. You know, great. Let's do it. That's that's what I mean. You know, these these people. You know, they're not they're not they're not in any way champions of free speech. You know, so we have this really weird class. We have a privileged class of people that only they can be offended. Yep. Everyone else has to suck it up. You know, you know, to, to all the gagglers out there, you know, George and I watch the media very closely. I can speak for George with absolute certainty. I am insulted all of the time. I am damaged every time. I am triggered all the time. I'm not suing people, okay? Right. That's right. why we do this podcast. Right. We right. try to push back without any violence, with a, a sense of humor sometimes, a little bit of spite, okay? That's our, that's our right of our, to be able to express our, our feelings freely. But, you know, again, this is whole bullying class of people. And Alex Berenson, you know, he totally disappoints me because I was a big supporter of his during his great trials. Right, right. And then to turn around and pound down on someone else. Alex Jones, everybody, it's not my cup of tea. I don't follow him. I've never been interested in him. I don't find him even mildly interesting or funny, but that's just me. I'm not going to deny other people to be able to consume what he has to say. That's a choice. Right. It's, it, but that's right. But it's, um, uh, it's really quite obnoxious um, of using the court system for, in a way that the court system was clearly not designed to do. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, the whole point of going after Alex Jones is then to go after others. I mean, just as, you know, Alex Jones was the first to be deplatformed. Um, With big everywhere. fanfare. With and big boom, fanfare. you know, it, you know that, that was, the, that was the, the, the tide broke until, you know, the sitting president of the United States 
was uh, deplatformed. And then think of all the other people who have been deplatformed, you know, scientists, because they didn't go along with COVID, you know, people like Robert Malone. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, that was, you know, these were people presenting reasoned arguments. They weren't going around um, uh, saying offensive things about uh, you know, the Prophet Muhammad. So they were just presenting reasoned arguments, but because they, it went against the official uh, storyline, boom, they get kicked off uh, uh, Twitter. So, so this, this is the point that, you know, if you're going to be an advocate of free speech and believe in, you know, we should, you know, people should have an exchange of ideas and that there is no right not to be offended, then you have to be against all uh, suppression of speech, not just, oh, well, I, you know, I, I, I'm only, you know, get, get worked up about it when it's Sir Salman Rushdie, because he's friends with Martin Amis and, uh, and he was friends with Christopher Hitchens and, you know, he's, he's a person in good standing in Lon the London cocktail circuit. So I'm, I'm there, uh, you know, on the steps of New York Public Library. That, that doesn't mean that you're a supporter of free speech. No, and also, again, it's, it's, it's a punching down strategy. I mean, again, the serfs, you know, you, you don't, you're not smart enough to think for yourself. You have, to be, you have to be told how to think, where to think it, and who to agree with. And this is what these people, I mean, the public intellectual, if I can use that term, there, there used to be such a group of people that are, I mean, the New York Review of Books for George and I coming up, okay? These were, these were interesting people. But now it just gets down to this some kind of um, uh, virtue signaling activism. That's, that's what meaning, it means to be a public intellectual today. Right. Salman Rushdie is not a great writer, everyone. Right. He, he, he wrote something that was controversial and hurtful for a large group of people. He shouldn't have, uh, uh, have had to live for decades under the fear of violence. That's wrong. George and I condemn that full heartedly. Right. right. Yeah. But that's, but that's the thing that, um, um, and I, you know, and this was at, at the time, uh, you know, as I said, with the Charlie Hebdo thing, you know, you would have people coming on and go, oh, well, you know, we're, we're very tolerant in the West. We don't, we don't do things like this. And so forth. But yeah, you do do things like that. I mean, you, you, you know, there is a great deal of intolerance. It just so happens that blasphemy just doesn't mean very much in a kind of secular Western world. I mean, it doesn't, you know, you can pretty much just say any, anything at all about Christianity. Oh, but we have secular bl uh, blasphemy. We but do. We, but that's it, that's secular blasphemy. I mean, as I say, for instance, uh, take the example of um, Holocaust denial. Yeah, people regularly go to prison. I mean, David Irving, you know, gets arrested, he goes to prison. Uh, what's his crime? Well, it, you, know, you know, they accuse him of Holocaust denial. Actually, though he didn't actually deny the Holocaust, but you know, that it, it's enough uh, that he doesn't quite uh, say everything that you're supposed to say, that get lands you in prison. So we do have our, uh, you know, sacred dots. The other day, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the um, leader of the Palestinian, he was in Germany, and, uh, and he was asked about the, um, the, the, uh, you know, the, I think, 50 year anniversary um, of the, it was, it was, it was, they were talking about the 50 year anniversary of the, Mun the killing of the um, Munich, uh, the Israeli athletes at uh, Munich Olympics. And, um, and, and they said, you know, well, you know, what, what do you think of the Holocaust? And he says, well, you know, Israel is guilty of 50 Holocaust. And there was an absolute uproar about how dare you say that, even though the point was about Abbas is that he, only, he cares about his people. So when he says 50 Holocaust, he says, yeah, that's what they did to my people, you know, but you know, that, you know, thing, hey, we're supposed to have a sort of different idea about this, you know, this the singularity of the Holocaust. Don't, don't, don't in any way, you know, bring that up. But why would somebody like Mahmoud Abbas care about our religious susceptibilities when it comes to the Holocaust? He says, yeah, but look what the Israelis have been doing to my people. That's what he cares about. <laughs> what does he care about our, our pieties and our liturgy? But that's what I mean, you know, it's something different for the Muslims and it's different for us. Well, at these, in particularly if we look at Western elites, the this like Western liberal elites, you know, they, they determine what it's sacred and it's secular uh, uh, things that are secularly uh, sacred. Um, and if and if you don't follow their dates and their names and commemorations, you know, well, then you're not even worthy uh, of part of the conversation. I mean, it was uh, early on. After the invasion of uh, uh, Afghanistan, um, I, I don't remember the public, the, the polling service, but they did, you know, uh, some kind of public opinion poll uh, of Afghans 
you know, and asking them uh, um, um, an opinion about 9-11. It was something like 90% of them never even heard of what, what, what 9 11. What's that? Okay. You know, because we, you know, again, you know, these, these elites, they expect us to yeah. worship their pieties. Okay. And if it's not, I mean, I, January 6th, I could give a hoot about that. It was a riot. People that broke the law should be punished. That's it. Okay. But that's a piety for them. That's right. So it's a piety. Yeah. There that, that was this, um, uh, it's on, it's on YouTube, a very good, um, um, lecture by a kind of famous um, uh, you know, uh, Singapore uh, thinker, and, um, and 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 he was saying about uh, about uh, apropos of this about that how Asians just don't see things the way you know you, they see them in the Anglo-Saxon media. So, for instance, you get a topic like Hong Kong. There is no one in Asia who gives a damn about Hong Kong. You know, they think you know Hong Kong was taken illegally from China. It, it, it reverted back to China in 1997. End of subject. Why are we talking about Hong Kong? I mean, it's like they, they just don't understand why you're bringing the subject up. And yet the Anglo-Saxon media, they're still going on and on about Hong Kong, which has already you know, been a, a topic that was settled a quarter of a century ago. Well, so and then, it's, it's like Western media, you know, we need a, 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 a Pacific NATO, you know, United States, Japan. I mean, and if you mention Japan, Everyone in Asia then, oh, they're coming back? Really? They're with the Americans this time, huh? I mean, it, it's common sense how people would see that around Asia, particularly as George and I have commented many times for the Japanese, the Second World War started with, with Hiroshima and ended at Nagasaki, okay? But people in Asia remember a very different history and, and uh, such a different history that it was, it helped form nations. Right. Nations came into being partly because of the uh, of, of Japanese imperialism, and now you want to build an Amer uh, American-led NATO with Japan at the spear? Really? Just the arrogance of these people. That's right. That, 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 that's right. And so that's why um, you know when when um, these these you know, Western these Douglas Murray types or uh, Amanda Foreman and you know who, who attending you know the, the, the stature of, of people has certainly gone down. As I say, when I was there back in '88, I mean those were all sort of big names. You know Norman Mailer, Susan Sontag. I mean it's it's, it's definitely not not quite at that um, level. But uh, you know, again, you know the, the, there's a feeling you know well you know we're here you know. Uh, uh, supporting civilization when in fact you're not really supporting any kind of civilization because you know salman rushdie he wrote a book not a very good book and he went out of his way to be as offensive as he could be to muslims and, you know and obviously it doesn't justify issuing a fatwa um but he didn't exactly write a great book he didn't exactly write a sort of a profound meditation on uh, <laughs> on uh, islam um but there's no saint thomas aquinas okay exactly and, 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 and there's no critique here i mean it's not like he hasn't even done a kind of voltaire or diderot or some of the like enlightened thinkers who uh, uh, who who attack christianity i mean he just went out of his way to be as offensive as he could be to a uh, muslim and they of course took the bait um but the notion that we we now have to say we have to, we're I'm, we're all salman rushdie now uh no we're not <laughs> I, I've always found that very curious. I think that it started back with John McCain and uh, August 2008. We're all Georgians, and I, like I'm not Georgian. <laughs> I'm not a Saakashvili follower. And then they, and of course, they do it with with Ukraine with the orange. We're all Ukrainians. Right? No, no. <laughs> Particularly in Ukraine, where a lot of people would say, "No, I'm Russian." Okay, I'm not Ukrainian. <laughs> no, but it, it it I can remember when I lived in Poland. Um, I was on a Fulbright fellowship. And um, you know the, the uh, communism had come to an end and everything, and m politics become rather mundane. And um, I was renting an apartment, and um, the man that was renting to me was an elderly man. He fought in the Second World War, and uh, the uh, Le uh, Lech Wałęsa's name popped up, and he said it was really interesting. He was a really small man, and he said he's your guy. And I said, I, I don't understand. He said, no, you people chose him. He's your guy. He's not our guy. We don't like him here, okay? Right, right. And, and because the, there's a very sense of elitism, you know, he was a worker, the, they're part of the schlachte, the right. intelligentsia. Right. But he said, you know, is Western leaders, Western media pumped up this guy way beyond proportion that they ever was in his own country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're, 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 that's right. That was the, the, the starkest example of that was, um, 
Mihail Gorbachev, who um, yeah, yeah. you know became man of the year, man of the decade, man of the century. I mean, it's like you know you just keep, keep giving him award. And a man without award. a country. <laughs> award after award. Whereas in his own country, <laughs> what was it? He, he decided to run for president, and he got what half a percent? Uh, you know, some 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 absolute ridiculous. Well, so he, he's he's an elderly man right now, and he has yeah. mobility problems. But if if he if he if he were perfectly healthy and he was walking down the street. He wouldn't be greeted. He'd probably be spat at. Yeah. yeah. Okay. At least by the older generation. Okay. Yeah. No, that's it. That's exactly right. Yeah, because you know, and it wasn't for communism. You got to remember that. Okay. It was for a country that was uh, won the Second World War and became, was preeminent on the world stage. And people, maybe they didn't like us, but they feared us, and that was good enough at the time. Okay. Yeah. No, and he no, 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 sure. pissed it all away. He did. He did. And did it very quickly as well. Yeah. He, comes, he comes to power in 85. No, well, gone, think of the amount of time. Think of the amount of time it took him to get to the very top. Yes. yes. And then he just threw it into the abyss. <clears throat> yeah. 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 That's right. And so everything that happens, you know, like um, uh, the war in Ukraine, you know, they think it's that bloody Gorbachev, you know, oh. wouldn't, be, wouldn't be in this bloody mess. <laughs> but but both people think that way. OK, uh, and, and conversely, conversely, uh, um, 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 during COVID in uh, Ukraine, before the conflict, um, uh, when COVID was being dealt with, because Western governments uh, told the Ukraine, don't buy um, uh, the Russian vaccine, don't get the Russian vaccine, because uh, if it's political, I guess, it's so stupid. And they, they were, they were um, uh, on Telegram and other um, platforms, it was circulating. If this were the Soviet Union, we wouldn't have had this problem. We would have ju just been vaxxed. <laughs> okay. right. no. yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, I mean, it's just going, going back to um, you know, going full circle to where we started, um, all, of, all of the people who were banned from Facebook and um, Twitter and everything else, these were serious commentators. This is here. We, we, they were talking about a public health uh, issue, and basically the, the powers that be decided that here, here's a point of view that should not be aired. This is information that people should not have access to. Um, and again, you know, the great you know freedom of speech crowd, you know, they just weren't there. They were, you know, just missing in action. I mean, again, I, I didn't hear anything from Douglas Murray. Um, so, you know, that, that's why there's, there's just a lot of bad faith. I mean, you know, you do get occasionally somebody, you know, consistent in, in, uh, in supporting free speech, so, somebody like Glenn Greenwald, but he's, he's unique. I don't think there's anyone really like Greenwald who, who actually is consistent in, uh, in, in supporting your free speech. Noam Chomsky was another one. Basically, you know, he was always, you know, whatever, you know, however much you disagree with this position, it should be given expression to. But that's not true. You know, most people are not. I mean, you know, so like, you know, like Laura Ingram, you know, some, uh, you know, a Palestinian thinker is kicked out uh, from Columbia University. Great. Two thumbs up. <laughs> you know, and First Amendment, free speech. You know, we, we conservative believe in free speech. Yeah, right. Right, because you, there has to be uniform. They, they talk about diversity, but it's all uniformity. And it's not a, a Democrat Republican thing. It's an elite problem for the rest of us because the elite has a consensus of what you can say and what you can't say. And they have an enormous amount of power to enforce it, okay? Unlike ever before. Think of the number of local newspapers that have disappeared over the last 50 years, George. I mean, it, and then, then you come up with these massive social um, uh, uh, social networks here that have so much editorial control. Right. I mean, my, even in medium-sized towns, there would always be at least two newspapers. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Washington Post. You know, I guess I guess the Washington Times. The, uh, Washington Washington Times is a uh, online thing now. It's not. You know, is, is it just, online? I, I yeah. I, I don't know whether it's, you can get a um, uh, a hard copy. But yeah, but other towns. I mean, the, you know, which used to. Uh, you know, small, you know, you always used to have two newspapers. Well, you know, ma many more than that. I mean, <laughs> New York used to have many newspapers. <laughs> I mean, that's all gone now. But um, uh, that, that, you know, that, that's right. And they had what's really great was the penny press, which I think is absolutely fascinating. I mean, everybody, you think that you know, um, conspiracy theories and crazy ideas. I mean, 
it, you know, at the turn of the 20th century, it's all over the place, okay? And it was up to the consumer if you want to buy it or not, okay? And 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 then it went through the 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 um uh, the public square of debate, bad ideas were pushed out. Sometimes it takes a long time. I agree, but there's a lot of things that George and I would agree with very with great certainty now that was discussed when we and, and heavily debated when we were growing up. Desegregation, for example, Jim Crow, and all these things hotly debated and. The, the right side prevailed, okay? Now we're going in reverse, okay? We're going- well, it, was a, it, was, it was a debate because remember when um, uh, Robert Bork, um, so in 1964, Robert Bork wrote an article in the New Republic um, attacking the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Um, and he did it on a, on a basically kind of a libertarian grounds. But nonetheless, that shows a New Republic, kind of a liberalish magazine, um, Robert Bork was a, an eminent uh, thinker. Um, so it was, you know, it was interesting, you know, that there was you know, a, a debate about this. You know, you have, you know, you have um, alternative points of view. I mean, it's a, of course, when it came time to, um, when Bork was nominated for the Supreme Court, he was of course challenged for this article and said, well, I, I don't really agree with this anymore, you know. So, so, but nonetheless, yeah. you know, you, you, you know, or, after all, at the time, fashionable liberal opinion was wholeheartedly for the Civil Rights Act. But nonetheless, there was still a debate. There was an argument to be made against it. Look at William F. Buckley, which if you look historically, folks, William F. Buckley was wrong on most things, okay, in retrospect, okay. Now, I still watch uh, uh, old uh, editions of Firing Line because I like to watch his train of thinking, his intellect, okay? But a lot of, but he was part in the thick of debate, which, at, and he added to debate because it, it created a better counter to what he was arguing. That's, that's, even if someone is fundamentally wrong on some things, they can play a very positive role in a public debate. We've, missed, we've lost that. We've right. lost that completely. All we get now, it's very truly mediocre people that are just wanting to terrorize and punch down at the rest of us. It's not, it's not, a, we do not live in interesting times intellectually. We don't. That's fair enough. All right, so everybody. Um, um, no one should experience violence for the things that they write and say. I mean, George sure. and I are very- that, 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 That's true. But that doesn't mean that Salman Rushdie deserves um, any any great praise, and so obviously sympathize with him. But you know, don't don't you know? I I I I don't want to be under an obligation to read the satanic verse. You know, to stand there at the New York Public Library steps and reading the satanic verses. No. Well, but but maybe you. you could read you know the indictments against Julian Assange. I think that would create that would more debate. That's sure. right, exactly. All right, everybody. This is a gaggle with Peter and George. We're on local, so please go to the gaggle.locals.com. Please visit our store. Today is Friday. That means yesterday, of course, you watch George's live stream. Exactly. Exactly. So that and that means now comes the nightmare till the next. You know, it's not a hiatus. I hate it. Exactly. This is like brutal. It's like, you know, it's like winter in Moscow. You have to wait four or five days <laughs> before the next um, uh, installment of uh, my live stream. So next one, Tuesday, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Please join me. Uh, come with questions, comments, criticisms, suggestions. Uh, everything is welcome. And on the way out the door, think about little buddy. Think about that uh, tip jar. You know, he's very, very depressed. You know, see if you can put a smile on his face. If you've got a few bob uh, tinkling around in your pockets, you know, whip them out, dunk them in the uh, <laughs> in his tip jar, and you'll be very happy. We're very grateful for all of your help, friendship, and support. Uh, the more you're able to donate, the more of these videos we can make, the more we can invest in new technology, and above all, the happier buddy will be. So remember, if you like the gaggle, please like, share, and subscribe. See you soon. Bye.